Welcome to the Decent People Podcast, a production of Decential Media, where we're committed to telling the stories of the founders, builders, and visionaries who are creating a new decentralized economy and internet experience. You guys know it as Web3 or blockchain, and we're going to bring you the smartest and most interesting people in the space for intimate conversations that reveal their background, how they got into crypto in the first place, and what they're doing today to make a decentralized future a reality. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure to check out our site at decentral.io. Now, to the show. Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of the Decent People podcast. I'm your host, Matt Lysing, and today I'm going to geek out a little bit with my guest, Matt Cutler, who is the um, co-founder and CEO of Block Native, which is a key infrastructure firm that uh, is dealing in pre-transaction um, uh, information on blockchains such as um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polygon, and a few others. Um, how you doing, Matt? I'm great. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first off, I noticed that you're a sailor. So I, I like having fellow sailors on the show whenever I can. I think you're up in San Francisco now, so I hope you have the chance to get out on a boat from time to time. So I live in Marin, so just over the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, and my new passion is what's called wing foiling, which is a very compact form of sailing. So uh, it's very big up here, but it's not a very well-known sport, but it looks a little like windsurfing, but you have a small board with a foil that goes under the water, but you carry a wing, there's no mass, it's like a light inflatable wing, and um, when you get going, it feels like you're flying. You, you can well, really yeah, you go. come out of the water on those, right? Yeah, yeah, it's super fun. I'm just a beginner, you know, mainly, you know, just trying to put the pieces together. It's quite challenging to learn, but I live right in, on uh, uh, Richardson Bay. And so right in my backyard is a great area called the slot. And my neighbors are out all the time. Me and a few friends got a little boat to tow behind. So we're at the beginning of that, but it's, it's super fun. And, uh, it, you know, youth is a state of mind and I, I like learning new stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm awesome. happy to be out on the water anytime I can be out there. Yeah, I, I've seen that down here in LA when it's flat, a lot of surfers will go out and, and do that. And it's yep. just amazing to watch. And then they've also got these ones that are now motorized or somehow, or there's- Oh yeah, there's a, yeah, they're a, a called jet. e-foils, and, yeah, yeah. which uh, I've tried, tried, and they're super fun. So if you ever have the chance to do an e-foil, I highly recommend it. You you know, I did, I spent more time on foil after 15 minutes on an e-foil than, you know, dozens and dozens of times out with a static foil. So it's great. The technology is moving really quickly. It's becoming more accessible. And, you know, there's all sorts of new things happening all the time. It's great to be a part of. Yeah, that's awesome. Good to hear. Um, so as I like to do on these podcasts, um, I'd love to hear about your upbringing and kind of where you came from and sort of your early life and what your parents did. Um, so where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town, small town outside of Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, uh, I, I come from a family of, of teachers. So my father was a oral pathologist and a university professor who wound up becoming a hospital administrator and ran uh, the largest teaching hospital in the state of Connecticut for a long time. And then my mother was a school teacher and eventually a, a um, uh, admissions, sort of head of admissions for a, a private school. And, and that was very important for me because uh, she made that switch when uh, I was in high school and I was able to go to a private high school uh, for free, which my family couldn't have afforded at the time. And that really sort of set my trajectory. So I went from being a pretty good student in public school to, to having a lot of uh, high expectations put on me in a different sort of environment and, and learn how to work hard and learn how to expect more out of myself out of that experience. That school is called the Avon Old Farms, by the way. It's an all boys school in Connecticut, which I was really lucky to attend. And my, me and my family are still very closely associated with. Um, and, and out of that, I was able to get admitted to MIT, which was, you know, a pretty big stretch. If you'd asked me at the beginning of high school, right, when I'm going to college, um, I was the first student accepted at MIT, uh, in probably 20 years, maybe more at the time. And, uh, that really changed my life. So I spent my undergrad at, at MIT, which was an amazing and very intense experience. Um, but I share that story because I got to MIT in 1991 and there was, Unix workstations all over campus, including in my fraternity where I lived across the river in Boston. So MIT is in Cambridge. And these computers were all connected to each other. And these computers were connected to other campuses and you could find out information and send messages and all sorts of cool stuff, play games. And only later did we learn that that was the internet. 
Yeah. And uh, it was, we, we were among, as students at MIT, you know, sort of the earliest users of modern, what we would recognize now as the modern graphical internet. And we didn't really appreciate it at the time because that was just part of what was going on at school. As I went through school more, we came to appreciate like, wait, we're way ahead of the curve as it relates to the internet. And it seems very obvious that this is the future. And, and that uh, element was, you know, if you were inside the internet in the early 90s, it was really obvious what was going to happen. But if you were outside the internet, it wasn't at all obvious what was going to happen, right? And, yeah. and that's a little bit of a preamble to my first reaction to Web3 was, oh, it seems really obvious what the future is going to be. But if you're outside Web3, it's not at all obvious. Yeah. I went to UC Santa Barbara and I remember that's, you know, 91 is when I started as well, um, getting my first email account. Um, I think UCSB was a way station on the early internet from um, the Bay Area down to, uh, I think it was UCLA, like the first um, DARPA net kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that was a it was a wild time. I just remember, you know, AOL chat rooms being like just kind of blowing my mind that I could just be kind of in with anybody around the world. Um, and just that sense of openness and expansiveness was really something that I've never forgotten. Yeah. When my, my brother and I were little, we got an Apple IIe with a modem and uh, we started to get on BBSs. And, uh, you know, sort of two formative stages of that was one, us thinking it was magic as kids that we could be typing with other people around the world. And my father saying, this is so silly, like just get on the phone and be faster. Right. And <laughs> sort of the, the generational disparity. Yeah. And then I think after the first month, we racked up a $200 phone bill, which at that time was a lot more money than it is right now. And my father being really angry about it and us having an understanding of, oh, this isn't for free. And so like, hey, these experiences sort of rolling forward into, you know, hey, you don't need to have a phone line dedicated. You don't pay by the minute. You know, you have kind of Activity, you have high speed, you have more. And, and the differences between closed or private systems and private BBSs and things like AOL and, and open decentralized systems like the early internet um, were pretty stark. And uh, I, it's funny, history repeats itself. Um, and maybe it doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes and it's certainly rhyming right now. Yeah. What, uh, what did you like to do as a kid? Were you into sports? Were you, um, I, you said you kind of came into your studies more when you went to uh, Avon Old Farms, but what were you doing um, before that? So I was always pretty athletic. I, I played soccer my whole life. Uh, I skied my whole life. Um, you know, I lived sort of in a, in a suburb, uh, you know, a very, it's, uh, uh, in Connecticut where we could explore in the woods and things like that. And, you know, it's funny. I, my kids believe that I grew up without the internet and mobile devices, but they can't quite imagine what life was like. Like, <laughs> how'd you have a soccer team? How'd you go places? How'd you meet people? Like all of these things that they just take for granted being mediated by, you know, internet connected mobile devices just wasn't an option then. So do you remember having like, I don't know if they had them on the East coast, but they're called Thomas guides. It was a map, like it was literally a big book of maps for where you were driving and like you had to know where you were going. Oh yes. How, <laughs> oh, you looked it up on the map. How, yeah. How to read maps was a, was a whole thing. Again, it seems archaic now, but you had to have these paper things and pulling over in gas stations and asking for directions and all that sort of jazz was just part of our experience. But also, you know, a snow day meeting up with your friends down the street and taking old skateboard decks, putting uh, um, a ski wax on them. And basically we called it snurfing, but, you know, <laughs> early forms of snowboarding before snowboarders were even a thing, you know, in, in the woods, you know, just being out as long as we can. And it was, it was a pretty great upbringing and a little quiet, a little sheltered. And, and uh, there were a lot of things that I wanted to get exposure to as I grew older, including alternative music and things like that, that sort of helped direct me. Um, and that was really, you know, uh, my curiosity about the world. And, and I was a pretty avid reader, uh, sort of led me to want to go to a, a bigger school, uh, you know, with that was really on the cutting edge of things. I got really lucky to, to be able to go to MIT. And, um, you know, that sort of curiosity hasn't stopped. And that sort of uh, quest for the new thing is never is never really satiated. Um, do you still follow soccer? Are you a fan of any team? Um, a, a little. I actually played soccer much more than I was a fan of soccer. And I, I played up until quite recently. I used to, when I lived in Boston before I moved out here, I played three seasons a year. I played indoor, I played outdoor, I played futsal. I coached uh, all of my kids for soccer, coached 19 seasons of soccer when they were little up until the point wow. where they needed much more qualified. Um, and only recently did I sort of get out of playing soccer 
mainly, you know, um, playing here and sort of finding the right chemistry of a team. And now that I'm out here, I really got into bike riding. So this is a great area for both road and mountain and gravel riding. And I'm a part of a bike club out here now. I still ski quite a bit, but I get to go to Tahoe, which is a whole different type of skiing than skiing on the East Coast and uh, wing foiling we just talked about. So, you know, I'm still pretty active. Yeah, I'm glad you got some West Coast skiing because I'm sorry to say it's far, far superior than anything on the East Coast. <laughs> it's it's almost a different sport, but uh, yeah. you know, I, I enjoy skiing no matter where I can find it. I noticed I laughed when I noticed that um, part of your major at MIT was architecture, yep. which you're you're doing a form of architecture now with what you've been doing. Um, so that, that I just kind of chuckled um, about that, but. Tell me a little bit about MIT and, and how um, that experience with the Unix, you know, um, consoles being all around. And then I, I think you kind of had the idea for your first company while you were still uh, an undergrad there. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So, I mean, MIT is an incredibly intense, interesting space. I mean, just the, the, there's two, the, probably the biggest thing to know about MIT is they select students um, and faculty on two dimensions, sort of intellectual capacity and, you know, scores, and then risk taking. And, and they basically try to find, you know, maximum risk taking. And so just imagine like 6,000, you know, fairly, you know, uh, high powered intellects that are also high risk takers and, and just in there together with very intense coursework. It's not an easy place academically, like you're truly academically challenged. Um, and, you know, made great friendships there, did, you know, you can do research from the moment you set on campus. Uh, at that time, it's different now, but you lived in independent living groups. So it really was sort of a very transformative experience and one that I'm really fortunate to, to have had. And it's great to see sort of how healthy that institution has remained over time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we did wind up, so while I was still an undergrad at MIT, we started our first company. And this is long before it was fashionable to do so as an undergrad, long before it was fashionable to an internet company. But we sort of felt like, well, the future is here. This is something we want to do. And to be honest, it, it felt sort of foreign, the idea of sort of going to work for some other company. Like you're pretty independent when you're there and we wanted to stay independent. So me and a, a bunch of guys got together and formed um, what would become the first ever web analytics business. Uh, I like to say that one was a nine-year overnight success. It was uh, called Net Genesis. It went zero to IPO. And at the time we went public was one of the top 35 IPOs in history. So that was a pretty wild ride, um, but it was challenging. And it's, it's easy to romanticize sort of what things were like in the formative stages of Web 1.0, but it was it's pretty desolate to be honest, because it was a pretty small community. It was pretty, people thought it was pretty weird. There were a lot of high powered, powerful, you know, uh, people with large budgets who felt like the internet was sort of a sideshow and that mm-hmm. something like AOL or, or later things like X8 at home would really be the, the, the dominant model. And it, it took a long time for it to become clear uh, how things were going to go. And so you got to build sort of in, in uh, relative obscurity and in the face of a lot of skepticism, right? Hey, yeah. by the way, it feels a lot like Web3 when I first got exposure to it. And, and I really felt like once I started to tune into Web3, it, it felt eerily reminiscent to the formative stages of Web 1.0. Yeah, I think the echoes are really fascinating where it was really a decentralized space when everything was was starting out, you could run your own server, you know, you could, you know, you could build your own computer, you know, you like, you could go get parts at like Radio Shack and put things together yourself, um, which is fascinating, like you say, a real um, parallel to Web3. Yeah, in the early stages, it wasn't that you could as you had to, right? So, so yeah. just imagine this, right? Hey, I want to get on the internet, like step one, you got to go buy a modem. Okay. Which, by the way, there's there's no th- no such thing as online, so you can't order the modem. You got to go to a place, know what a modem is, know how to. It's a piece of hardware that either is attached to your you know box because laptops weren't really a thing at this point, or yeah. inserted inside. So you have to, to to know to buy a modem. You need to have an ISP relationship. You need to know what an ISP, an internet service provider, was. You need to know how to sign up for one. By the way, everything was Windows at this stage. Mac was was much less prevalent than it is right now. And that generation of Windows machines didn't even have a TCP IP stack built into them. So your computer did not know how to speak the protocol. So you had to know what a TCP IP stack was. You need to know how to download and configure one so that your a machine with its modem could then communicate over TCP IP with the internet, right? Then you had to know what a browser was, had to know how to find a browser. You had to have a, enough 
connection time, which by the way, often could take overnight to download a browser. You had to install and configure the browser. And then you had to know what to type into the browser to see something interesting on the internet, okay? And that's where this started, okay? And people said, that's crazy. It was so hard. You go, yeah, it really was hard. And yet people still did it. People figured it out. Yeah, it was it, fun. And, exactly. Uh, and how did you do it? How did you figure out? Well, you typically ask your friend, like, Matt, you're on the internet. Can you come over this weekend and, and get me set up, right? By the way, it's really hard to get started in Web3, right? How many times have I asked, Matt, can you come over and get me set up on Web3? I want to get a wallet. I want to get some currency. I want to start doing some stuff. And you know, I've read a bunch about it, but I actually want to go hands-on. So in this capacity, it feels very, very similar. Now you fast forward a few years and it gets easier and easier, right? It's more and more access, more and more embedded. Hey, by the way, AOL starts putting you know CD-ROMs inside serial boxes. This literally happened. And AOL, which is a, a proprietary system, has a gateway to the internet. So there was a portion of AOL that gave you full access to the internet. And that was the way that many folks got exposure to it. And, and again, I think we're seeing many of the same parallels in Web3, where it's getting easier and easier. You're seeing traditional entities begin to embrace it. You're getting limited exposure and other capacities. And I think this is all quite bullish for the overall state of adoption. Yeah. What did NetGenesis do? What were you guys, what was the service you were providing? Oh, we were one of the big pioneers of web analytics. So measuring what was going on on websites, all this activity was happening on websites. How do you make sense of it? How do you know what's happening? How do you direct your, your things? These days, like the, the antecedent to that would be Google Analytics. So the, the precursor to Google Analytics was NetGenesis. And there's a couple of other them out there as well. But uh, I wrote a white paper in the 90s called the E-Metrics white paper that generated this notion that there was new metrics that would measure this new medium. Um, that's still a going thing. E-Metrics is still a, a thing that's live. The co-author is still running all of that, a guy named Jim Stern. It won the white paper of the year in the software so, uh, industry. So, you know, I've been lucky to be fairly early in some of these big technology um, waves and, and do, you know, sort of seminal work. Um, and, and have a lot of fun and have some, some good outcomes along the way and have some not so good outcomes along the way too as, as what happened. What did you think of um, when the, we went from sort of web 1.0 to web 2.0 where you know, there's now big centralized kind of gatekeepers like Facebook and others. Did, did, that, did, did the problems with that occur to you organically or what, what, was, your, what was your take on that um, during that time? It's interesting. So I, I, I've been building startups. So depending on your account, I've done seven or eight startups. I've bought them, sold them, split them, merged them, shut them down, taken them public. Um, so, so I've been around the block a few times. And I, I was, we were building stuff through, you know, mobile 1.0, through web 2. And, and I think, you know, I, my personal experience is kind of the law of unintended consequences, where there was this pursuit of, you know, more advanced capability of, of, um, uh, more precise targeting of more relevant experiences, more interactive experiences. And at least from my vantage point as a founder and an and operator, uh, I didn't really think through sort of the implications of sort of the value aggregation that was happening and that, you know, uh, in the early phases, one of the companies that I work with worked super closely with YouTube. And mm -hmm. it was in the early stages of viral video. And, and in, at those stages, there were many sites where you could go to get video. And YouTube was just one of them. And, and we were very much a part. So this company was called Visible Measures. And one of the things that that group pioneered was tracking the spread of viral video and being able to quantify the reach of viral video, which turned out to be quite a big deal. Um, for us, it was very important as an independent operator for it to be a multipolar world where there would be you know, many providers because that basically gave us multiple partners and it made the data much more interesting. But over time, it became clear that there was this pretty massive consolidation onto the YouTube platform. And that gave YouTube a lot of power and a lot of control and gave, by the way, that company as an independent operator, fewer and fewer options in terms of determining its future because it was so tied to uh, this one major platform. And we've seen how that sort of played out. So, you know, uh, I, I, my, from my point of view, it wasn't some master plan of centralization. It was a consequence of some of the the, the pursuits of the technology and of the, the data and the, the, the economics behind it. I think where we wound up is, is unfortunate and, and is problematic. And the you know, entire Web3 space from the Bitcoin white paper is in direct reaction to that. Um, and I think, again, it's quite constructive. And that's why I, I jumped into Web3 as soon as I started to pay attention. Yeah, I think it's always um, 
a case with people, with human beings, that convenience is a huge driver of behavior and just, you know, not having to know seven different, you know, web um, based video services, just knowing YouTube, you know, kind of, it, it just, uh, everything accrues, you know, the eyeballs kind of accrue. Yeah. And then YouTube gets to know you. And so you have a better YouTube experience. So you spend less time elsewhere. And it's a, it's a positive feedback cycle that has negative externalities, like some of the ones that we're experiencing today. Yeah. Um, so then you spent, uh, a bit, I think NetGenesis you sold, and then you um, sold another company to Cisco and you spent some time there. Um, wh what were you doing with Cisco back in the day? Sure. So my most recent startup before Block Native was a mobile collaboration platform called Collaborate.com. Um, it was founded uh, maybe 2010, 2011 on, on the radical idea that people do real work on their phones, yeah. which, which was crazy at the time because phones were for games and laptops were for real work. Um, fast forward to today, we know how that all played out. Uh, that was an early exit to Cisco, which was great for me and my team, great for our investors. And a part of the terms of that deal, me and my team had to move from the Boston area to the Bay Area. So that's why I live here. I'm from the East Coast originally. And I spent uh, more than four years and as, as an executive in Cisco's collaboration business unit, which was you know, the totally opposite end of the spectrum. It's a very large, very complex organization with very big customer relationships. But I, I got to do a whole bunch of fun stuff while I was at Cisco. So uh, I became the first ever chair of what's called the Cisco Founders Forum, which is the CEOs and co-founders of all the companies that Cisco has acquired that's still part of Cisco. And so that was actually a really great and interesting group of people. Out of that, I led an initiative to uh, uh, build a global design thinking transformation. So I organized a global design community. Uh, we developed a Cisco specific design thinking methodology. We wrote a book. I have a copy of it around here somewhere. I don't know where it is, but uh, it's a book I'm really proud of. Um, we uh, developed labs. We did trainings all over the world. And, and, and that was super exciting and fun to be a part of and, and was very formative for me in terms of paying attention to, to design and design thinking, which by the way, dates back to my undergrad at, at MIT with architecture is very much part of what I was studying. Um, and uh, that was an interesting experience, but ultimately a big company living is quite a bit different than doing early startups, that's for sure. Yeah. And I, I believe it was during this time that um, you first got into, uh, exposed to crypto. Yeah. So, you know, I had been sort of tangentially aware of, of Bitcoin from the early days because I've been active on Reddit for a very long time. And I actually met Alexis Ohanian just when he was getting started. And, and much to my own financial detriment, I kind of ignored it because I was busy doing other stuff. And I had a good friend who, who said, Matt, you should really start paying attention. There's some really interesting things happening. And I'd say, hey, look, I'm busy doing Cisco stuff. And then six months later, he'd come back and say, Matt, you should really start paying attention. And on the third or fourth of these conversations that we had, I finally started to pay attention and, and get involved. And, and I fell down the rabbit hole quite quickly. And, and again, my first reaction was, I've seen this movie before. It feels exactly like Web 1.0, where it's relatively obscure. It's hard to use. Uh, there's tremendously obvious advantages to this model, but it's in early stages. And the outside world thinks it's sort of strange and scammy, right? That's You can just swap out Web 3 for Web 1. It was the same narrative. And um, though I was, you know, I would just say well compensated as an executive at Cisco, uh, I, I kind of thought two things. One, how unlikely that I would be an operator in the formative stages of Web 1.0 early in my career, and then later in my career still be an operator and have a crack to be an operator in Web 3. And, uh, and then I also knew that if I didn't jump in, I would you know, forever regret it, that, that this was sort of the, the next big wave and, and I was going to be on the sidelines and I've never really been on the sidelines of a big wave. So um, I jumped into the space in 2017 and uh, we haven't looked back. It's been a lot of work and it hasn't been easy, but um, uh, we've made a lot of progress and it's, we're in a great spot today. So it's exciting to be doing what we're doing. Yeah, I remember finally wrapping my head around um blockchain pretty much. I'd known about Bitcoin, but sort of dismissed it. I didn't understand how ones and zeros could have any value um, to my detriment as well. And I was covering Wall Street at the time in 2015 and just um, like market structure and how things work or don't work. And, and I realized really kind of like a lightning bolt moment where all these banks and, and all these financial companies could really benefit and, and are probably going to be moving towards um, some sort of network effect blockchain um, you know, uh, business model for, for kind of back end office, back office stuff. And, uh, 
it, it was again like yeah really kind of hard to explain to editors and and, and things but um over time it just kind of you know it's all it's only been growing um was there a certain um project like in ethereum or anything that really sort of like got your juices flowing creatively and, and made you realize that that that's like i need to jump into this um, so yeah, the, the big one that sort of captured a lot of people's imagination was CryptoKitties, which which really sort of opened the aperture that this was uh, uh, about more than just you know money and tokens and things like that. That there was a, a much broader palette of expressivity that was possible in these systems. Yeah, and, let's um, let's tell listeners like CryptoKitties was almost the first NFT project, I believe, uh, yeah. one of the first, and it was 2017, right? Roughly? Yeah, it, Crypto Kitties was a NFT game um, that the, the, the originators of, were actually the authors of ERC-721 that allows for non-fungible tokens. And so there were um, ERC-20 and, and non-fungible elements before, but uh, among the very first ERC-721 assets were CryptoKitties, which by the way, I'm still a holder. Um, and it was a, a fairly you know, interesting collectible game where you'd buy a kitty and you could breed them and you could generate new kitties and there's sort of a trading element to it. And, and at the time, it totally blew up. There was this massive run on kitties of gas fees exploded. Yeah. And, and, and it, it was the beginning of, I think, the, the realization that there is a much broader cultural aspect, a much more um, sort of fun and lighthearted aspect to this that could leverage some of these very technologically sophisticated underpinnings. And, and as a result, there would be, you know, this wasn't just for the, the obscure edge cases, this was for regular people, right? It still was really hard to use. It still was really sort of nerdy and esoteric, but again, you know, you can squint and see it. It's like, an Atari 2600 game compared to a PS5, right? Yeah. You know, it was just blocks moving around the screen and now it's almost photorealistic, but you know, it didn't take much. Once you could understand what a console system could do, you could pretty quickly imagine to a future state where it was much more sophisticated like we have today, right? And, and at least for me, but I think for many other people at the time too, CryptoKitties was kind of that unlock where it, it became less abstract and more sort of tangible and more like, and by the way, CryptoKitties, it's interesting insofar as it didn't have much precedent, meaning there wasn't anything else you could really compare it to. It wasn't like, it's like Magic the Gathering, but for this way, it was kind of its own thing. And it was definitively and intentionally whimsical. Like it wasn't some like mecha warrior thing, or it wasn't right. something super hard edge. It was like cute and fluffy. And and I don't know, they got a lot of things right. And I have a lot of respect for that team that did that. Yeah, and I that think, very I think cute and fluffy out. is kind of the core of the Ethereum developer community, really. Yeah, it's and, not and I, Yeah, they... I mean, they got a lot of shit at the time, I remember, and I never thought that was justified because, it, it, like you said, it unlocked this idea of digital scarcity and, and a collectible digital good for the first time. And I think a lot of people just thought, oh, that's a stupid picture of a cat. Um, but actually, it was so much more than that. Yeah, I mean, the same thing is happening today. It's just a stupid picture of an ape, right? Well, they're, they're very valuable. Right. Um, and so again, you know, I, I, there's always going to be lots of skeptics. And, and by the way, there were many, many skeptics in the early stages of the web, including very intelligent, very powerful, very well compensated skeptics. And, you know, it, it turns out not to be very fruitful to engage with those skeptics because they're going to come along later anyways. It's much more fruitful to engage with those who are already on board and believing. But I, yeah. I have the same. Paul saying, Krugman is probably my favorite of the early web skeptics. And he's yeah. a very big crypto skeptic to this day. So, you know, it's funny, like in the early days of the web, powerful magazine publishers would say, look at this junk. Like, look, look at these crappy websites compared to the newsstand, right? Yeah. Look, how many websites could there really be? Like there's like hundreds of magazines, right? That reflects the audience and what people want. It's very established, right? You had newsstands all over the country. They want um, slick production. They want glossy photos. They want well-produced editorial. They don't want this, this junk, which is on the internet, right? And what those people didn't really fully appreciate was the internet made, the co made content programmable, one, and the cost of distribution, zero. Okay. And when you add these two things together, programmable, programmability, and low or zero cost of distribution, what winds up happening is uh, a million flowers bloom because it turns out that the magazine model was only economically effective for 
audiences of a certain size that you could aggregate and then sell a magazine to, right? But when it turns out that you know you don't have to worry about that stuff because it's free to program the content and it's free to, to distribute the content, that there's vastly more interests out there than there are magazines or, or television stations, right? And so what did you have with the internet? You have this massive explosion of content. I mean, far greater than anything that had come before it of all various sorts and of all various quality. And it completely swallowed the traditional you know, uh, publishing industry as we know today. Well, where are we today? Look at this junk in crypto. Like what people don't want that people want well structured financial products from banks who they trust like JP Morgan, right? And you go, wait a sec, like JP Morgan has a limited and I'm not picking on JP Morgan, I'm just using an example, or city or pick your favorite, right? They have a limited number of financial products because it's non trivial to produce them and it's non trivial to distribute them. But as it turns out when you cre can create financial ideas that are programmable, and free or low cost to distribute. Guess what happens? A million flowers bloom. And it turns out, though, even though you and I are of a similar generation and probably from a perspective of a traditional bank, fairly similar classes of customers who would require fairly similar products, we may have very different needs, right? And, and our needs can't be adequately serviced through the traditional model, but through a, a Web3 programmable, open, decentralized model, we could have radically different you know, products that we choose to engage in and services that we choose to use. And that's very sustainable. So this is part of the reason and why I'm so bullish on, on future growth of this category. Yeah. And you, um, so Block Native got its genesis in this. You wanted to create, I think, uh, a platform for trading um, the CryptoKitty NFTs. But, or, or tell me a little bit more about that. But then I know that it's very quickly kind of veered off once you started talking to people and asking, what do you want? Or like, you know, listening to customers or, or, or folks you, you guys like kind of took a new path. Yeah, exactly. And that's very much my entrepreneurial experience is you never really know what you have until you build something and get feedback on it and listen to the feedback. So early stages of, of the antecedent to Block Native, we had a different name at the time, was building NFT games inspired by CryptoKitty. So it was a net new you know idea, net new games, but very much ERC-721 focused. And by the when I got on board, there was a small team already working. We had smart contracts, we had visuals. And um, having come from Cisco and do, done a bunch of design thinking, I was a big believer in user testing. And so we had this game to the point where we could start to, to do some user testing. And we, we went forward with that. And it was without question, the worst user testing had ever been a part of. Like it was... <laughs> terrible. And I was mortified by this. But this, the reaction of the team at the time really surprised me, which I said, oh, no, 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 none of that, none of that feedback is us. What do you mean? Like, oh, that's Ethereum. That's MetaMask. Like, these are all issues that like, we're not a part of. Like, that's just others. I was sort of like, guys, we're not trying to like be the best thing that someone who's hopped through these hoops can be. We're trying to build a general purpose game here. And if it's not usable, we're really going to be in trouble. Yeah. And we were sort of at an impasse until I said, you know, could we do something about this? Could we help the user out? Team was kind of surprised by this. Yeah, we probably could. And in a very short period of time, maybe a couple of weeks, they built two little widgets. One widget that would detect if you had a wallet installed or not. And if you did not, would help you get a wallet and then help you get it configured, which by the way, at that time, MetaMask was the only game in town. So it was really about MetaMask. And then two, MetaMask and, and Web3 at, at that stage was full of these ghost clicks, meaning you could click and do something and you get no feedback as an end user. You wouldn't know what was going on. This created a lot of anxiety. And so what we did was we would provide real-time feedback on the state of transactions as you were conducting them. So you knew that things were happening, even though you weren't getting any feedback in the UI. We build these quickly. They're sort of prototypes. We go back and do more user testing. It's way better. Okay? I mean, we still have work to do, but it's like, oh, okay, we solved it. And I started to build contacts in the Web3 industry, and we started to show what we were building to them. And I think I had probably six meetings in a row that, that went like this. This game you're building, eh. But those little helper things, those are really awesome. Could I have one of those? Could you build this for me? And it was at that point that we realized that there is sort of no developer tooling and that a lot of folks are really worried about usability. And, and we realized that there was this big gap in infrastructure and that if we focused on that, that we could really, um, one, 
drive a lot of adoption of what we were doing, and then to you know move the ecosystem forward in ways that we thought was important. So we pivoted the organization from being NFT game developer, which in retrospect might have been a better thing to do over the long haul, um, into building Web3 infrastructure, first focused on usability, and then now increasingly focused really on the, the core pre-chain layer. And we changed the name of the company to Block Native, and, and uh, it's been sort of off to the races ever since. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that I first fascinated me about crypto was that, you know, I was very familiar at Bloomberg News with like the futures market or the bond market, which was completely fully developed and, and decades or century old, you know, like the bond market basically does not change. And, and all the infrastructure was there. People were trying to modernize it, but, you know, it was there and in place. With crypto, all of a sudden, I'm I got to see these things being built right before me, and and just the leaps and bounds that people were making um, has for the last seven years or so has just been been really cool to watch. It's it's the it's one of the great joys of of being early in a major technology transformation is you get to have a front row seat to a lot of these big innovations and changes that are happening. It's super accessible. So, you know, the, the leading lights in the space, you can go to any of these conferences and rub shoulders with, and they're all, most of them are super approachable and, and uh, that's super great. And then if you're so inclined, you can get involved and actually impact and, and build stuff, right? And there's so much white space out there. There's so much sort of, you know, you say blue ocean, right? Of just sort of um, new vistas to explore. And, and it's, it's quite, it's as a, as a technologist, as a builder, as a software developer, it's pretty fun to be operating in a, in a region where you're the first and you're the one, you know, cutting new paths. It's also challenging, right? But um, there's a lot of uh, creativity that you're able to, to exercise along the way. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, as a writer, it's just been great. I mean, it's just, there's so many great characters and, and you're right. Everybody's very approachable and, and very willing to help you learn and figure things out. Um, so let's, let's, let's geek out a little bit now. Um, I think while, when we get to the mempool stuff before, maybe we just kind of lay the foundation with a little bit of blockchain 101. Um, so maybe just, if you could just quickly tell the, our listeners, like what, when you send a transaction, like, you know, you want to go buy some ether on Coinbase, what happens to that transaction as it, as it gets sent to the blockchain? And, 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 and let's, let's maybe start there and then we can get a little more um, detailed. Sure. So the way that I usually explain this is, you know, when you do a crypto transaction and you press submit and then you, you wait for a while and then it says confirmed or, or failed or otherwise, people go, yeah. Go, what do you think happens while you wait? Like, I don't really know. You go, turns out that's what's known as the pre-chain layer. So there's this notion of on-chain, which is data that's that's on a chain, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin or, or any of the others. And you have this notion of off-chain, which is everything that's not on a chain, right? The rest of the world. But there's this sort of transition zone called the pre-chain layer, which is where transactions go to be candidates for inclusion. And, and by definition, any public uh, blockchain network needs this zone because otherwise you could just write directly to the blockchain without any consensus being formed and you wouldn't have a blockchain at all, you'd have a database, right? Yeah. And it turns out that this pre-chain data layer is um, not like anything else that's that's in Web3. Um, insofar as Web3 likes to build itself as open source and open data and open access and, and, and a level playing field. Everybody has access to the same stuff. Um, that's not true of the pre-chain layer. So this data layer is before consensus happens. So there is no truth, okay? Um, in this pre-chain layer, things are mutable. You can change them around. So the, the truth can be one thing at one point and then rapidly change. Uh, blockchains move forward like a watch. They click forward with each block. In the case of Bitcoin, it's about every 10 minutes. In the case of Ethereum, it's about every 13 seconds. But the pre-chain layer is a real-time layer, meaning at any millisecond, at any nanosecond, a new transaction can be submitted to the network. Um, it is transparent if you know how to uh, uh, capture, normalize, and work with this data. But that requires a pretty significant uh, degree of technical understanding and of infrastructure to do so. And so what you res what the end result is you have have and have nots. You have actors in the space who have this expertise, who have this infrastructure, who know how to work with pre-chain data, sort of the, the stuff that's the transactions that will be candidates for inclusion moving forward and, and everybody else who does not. Yeah. And what we do at Block Native, just to read ahead a little bit, is we, we're we sort of a public good where we are a public project whereby we um, make sense of this for everybody and provide tooling to make this as easy to work with as any other aspect of Web3. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, even 
lay, you know, regular users, quote unquote, uh, are well served to be aware of how this stuff works and, and how to work with it. Because, you know, sooner or later, you'll encounter issues in the pre-chain layer and how to, you need to know how to resolve them. Yeah. So this is, yeah, the, the mempool or the pre-chain layer um, is, to me, um, one of the more fascinating aspects of a blockchain, because when you're talking about like entering a stock order on the NASDAQ, um, th there's no waiting time there. You're, you're getting filled in milliseconds, you know, <clears throat> and here, um, but with like Ethereum, you kind of go to this waiting room and, and your transactions are there and they're going to be broadcast and hopefully miners pick them up and put them in a block. Um, but while those transactions are sitting in the mempool, there's a lot of wacky stuff that can happen. And um, this is what's been fascinating to me ever since I read Ethereum is a Dark Forest by Dan Robinson and, yep. and about like the front running and the, the bots that people have been able to create that um, can basically read your transaction as it's waiting there. And, and then let's say it's a, it's a big order to buy Ether. They'll, they'll get in front of that transaction, hopefully buy the Ether first. And then when your transaction comes through, bump up the price right and and i just i just find that all just incredibly fascinating but to be honest i still haven't quite wrapped my head around it all <laughs> yeah so so the way to think about this is if if on-chain data is the truth right you can't change it then all future truth exists in the pre-chain layer or in a mempool somewhere and you know mempool is the term of art of certain places other chains don't use that so we'll, we'll use mempool for now but if you can make sense of the mempool, you can see the future of truth, right? Not kind of, not sort of, you can actually with a very high degree of confidence know what's going to happen next. Yeah. And it turns out in financial systems, if you know what's going to happen next, that creates all sorts of profit opportunities. So it creates things like what are called sandwich attacks, where you take a transaction and you put a transaction just in front of it and just before it, and you adjust the price a little bit and you uh, affect the exchange rate or the profitability of that trade, then you extract some value as a result. Um, this is commonly referred to as MEV or minor extractable value or maximal extractable value, that sort of notion. There's also lots of arbitrage where you can say, hey, there's multiple exchanges where a certain asset pair gets traded. And because I'm aware that there's a large trade that's gonna move a price on exchange A, I can though go do something on exchange B because there's gonna be a price disparity between those things and I can profit from that. This is actually pretty healthy because what it does is sort of ensure price parity uh, you know, rapidly over time. But um, in this world of programmability, then you have uh, sophisticated actors who build trading bots or, or various forms of automated systems that are listening to transactions being broadcast and are making very rapid decisions about how to react in order to uh, make gains, right? Uh, these often come in the form of, you know, hacks or exploits where um, they're not breaking anything, but, you know, someone was not particularly careful or made some assumptions that were bad assumptions. And then these automated systems can take advantage of that. And so uh, Ethereum as a dark forest is sort of a seminal piece. And, and what our infrastructure does at Block Native is illuminate the dark forest and, and help people navigate it with, with confidence. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Do you worry at all that like in traditional financial markets, some of this would definitely be illegal and would get you in trouble with regulators? Or is there any concern here now or is the architecture so different that um, it's just a new kind of thing? Well, so I, I would I would argue that these sort of things happen all the time in traditional financial markets. I mean, if you look at what Citadel does, what do they do? They buy order flow from Robinhood and they basically front run trades. I mean, that's all of Citadel is exactly this, is basically getting order flow and, and making um, very fast, uh, very, you know, a fraction of a cent uh, optimizations across millions of times. So uh, uh, these sort of things are, are actually rampant in the traditional financial system, but they've been the exclusive domain of large financial services operators with, you know, banking licenses with the infrastructure necessary to do that. And regular participants in the markets like you and me, you know, we're, we're stuck at retail, right? So the good news about Web3 is it, again, it, it opens this up. Anyone can participate. You don't need anything special. The challenge is, is it, it potentially makes it a little bit more acute. Um, but ultimately, I think it, it becomes sort of steady state. Uh, I, I draw an analogy uh, to the world of SEO. So everyone's familiar with SEO, search engine optimization, right? What's the basic idea? Clicks matter, right? Getting, getting clicks to your website. And when someone searches on a term, what rank you are in that has an outcome on your business. 
So what do you do? There's all sorts of things you can optimize to ensure that your pages rank highly on search, right? Because there's economic advantage in doing so. And no one has a hard time with this. This is just a fact of life about getting traffic to your websites, SEO, right? Oh, by the way, you want to pay to have access to that? That's SEM, search engine marketing. You buy ads, right? This is not all that different, right? What matter? You have blocks, you have transactions in a sequence, and there can be economic value depending on which transaction happens in, in, in which sequence. There's expertise that's involved in determining that sequence. There's commercial services that, that provide that to you. So in many ways, I view it as, as not in any way dissimilar, but, but much more public and, and open than it was before. And you know, at the end of the day, these are in many ways inescapable facts of this technology. Like, uh, uh, it really doesn't matter what the law says, it's sort of what's possible. Um, there are technologies that are coming up to make this stuff a little bit more resistant to these sorts of things. But at the end of the day, like uh, this is a, a, this is a, a, an inescapable reality of ordered financial systems is order matters. Yeah, I think like what Phil Dian's doing, the, the guy that came up with the term um, minor extractable value at, with flashbots is really, really interesting um, yep. and what you guys are doing uh, as well. Um, I think you've mentioned you have kids. Um, I think they're teenagers now. Um, are they into this or like what, where did, and if so, like what's the on-ramp for them? Like that's been appealing. Uh, there, I have three kids, uh, 18, 16 and 10. And certainly the, the teenagers are curious and interested and I've sort of helped them out a lot. It's always an interesting process as someone who's on the inside is sort of how do you guide someone through? And, and I've tried multiple ways. And, and basically what I've found is you can't force it on anybody, even, you know, even if you think it's in their best interest, that there's just too much volatility, there's too much complexity that if someone's not really interested in learning this themselves, then, then it's just not going to be a very positive exercise. Um, my oldest is very into photography and very into art. And therefore, a lot of the NFT action has been quite interesting to him. He's a big fan of Banksy. And so there's a, a, a fractional ownership of one of the major Banksy works that he was super interested in. And I just think it's really constructive that one, it's permeating mainstream media. It's, you know, they're very aware. My other son, by the way, is very into sports. And so there's a lot of sports NFTs that are out there. Yep. And um, I, I think the, the net net is, Sort of like when I was a kid and my dad, you know, got an Apple IIe mostly because he thought it would be a good thing for us to have exposure to, right? It wasn't so much like, oh, we're going to set up your future, but like, this is something that I think is important that you're going to need some familiarity with. I think the same thing is very much true of Web3, that um, yeah. the sooner kids can get exposure and familiarity, the, uh, the better they're going to be over the, the course of their life. Yeah. My 13 year old son, I could not get him to buy into NFTs, no matter how hard I tried. And, and it was many different conversations about it and trying to just get him to understand it. And he's a really great artist. I was like, you could do something and we could like sell it and donate the money to charity. And he's just like, no, it's a scam. And then Axie Infinity came around and now he's super into that. And it's just like, you know, Okay, now you get it, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I get asked, what's the right way to on rep people? And I said, you, know, you got to meet them where their interests are, right? So if your son is interested in playing games like Axie, that's a great on ramp, right? And, and, you know, the whole idea is just, it's, I always say, like, in the early 90s, people would be like, yeah, I've read a bunch about the internet. I think I get it. And so you definitely don't get it. Right? Like, what do you mean? Like, Until you've gone hands on with the browser, you just don't get it, right? You put someone down in front of them, they go, oh yeah, you're right. This is totally different. Like, exactly. Same is true of Web3, that, that you're not really going to get it until you can go hands on with it. And even then it's going to take some time. But going hands on with Web3 is challenging because there's real money involved, right? So people have natural anxiety about it. So I think some of these play to earn games are really quite interesting as a way to get in and, and sort of start to accumulate some value. Um, but there's all obviously all sorts of other ways too. So uh, it seems pretty clear to me, it's sort of over the tipping point that like the, the momentum is building and and uh, particularly through the, the, the media channels that matter, like through influencers and Twitter, like this is pretty well established. So I think we're on the, the, uh, the, the expansion period of adoption, just like we were in the expansion period of the internet in the, in the late 90s. Yeah, a lot of people, speaking of the 90s and the internet, they talk about the Netscape moment, that that was, do you agree with that? Was that something that really unlocked it for a lot of people? Well, again, it was, I lived it, right? So there were, there were many phases, but certainly, you know, 
uh, the advent of Netscape, which was sort of a, a fully packaged and polished consumer oriented browser, which up to that point, the state of the art was this thing called Mosaic out of the University of Illinois, um, Champagne, uh, Champagne, uh, Champagne, yeah, Urbana, something like that. That's where Mark Andreessen was. So again, it was it was sort of a nerd tool that got less nerdy. And then, yeah. you know, uh, 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 Mark and Jim Clark formed uh, what became Netscape and uh, built something which was aimed at normal people, right? It was still definitively a web browser. It was just um, not just packaged and polished in a way that was more consumer friendly. It was distributed in a way that was cons consumer friendly. And I think we're seeing a lot of that happen right now. We're seeing the consumerization of the technologies, whether it be Coinbase as a on-ramp or, or other major exchanges, whether it be um, you know non-custodial wallets. There's a whole bunch of activity in non-custodial wallets. So people can control their private keys. Um, and also sort of traditional financial should be called personal entities. wallets, to be honest. What? What? I, I think they should be called personal wallets. Non-custodial yeah. is just like, what does that even mean? It's yeah, just your wallet. You know, everybody knows their wallet. It's in your purse or it's in your pocket. It's kind of the same idea. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I'm a nerd, so you know, I'm, I try to be technically accurate about this. But you're right, custodial versus non-custodial is not particularly um, informative to your your average consumer, right? Yeah. Um, but I think the idea of like what a private key is and and what a real secret is 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 a pretty foreign concept to most um, consumers. And so there are many ways you can get into a bad spot if you're not really familiar with with the intricacies of that. Um, and, and again, there are technology solutions that are coming out to make that increasingly sort of more consumer friendly. Do, and easy. do you think crypto has had that Netscape kind of moment yet? Or are we still waiting for it? Um, it's funny, like, you know, if you look back at the formative stages of Web 1.0, you know, uh, Google came a, a decade later, right? Uh, Facebook came even later than that. Um, I think we, we're seeing early indications of sort of mainstreaminess, but but I think when the history is written, much of what will matter has not been invented yet, has not come out yet, that, that those entities are not there yet. So yeah. I, I very much still feel we're in the preamble phases of this, not in sort of the, the, the sweet spot of it all, which a lot of times people go, oh, I missed it. It's too late. And I go, no, 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 it's still super early. Like there's so much that needs yeah. to be done and so much opportunity out there. And, and the final thing I'll say is, you know, in the 90s, the online world was small, and the offline world was huge, but the trend was clear. Online was growing and offline was shrinking. And I used to predict we're going to live in a world which is mostly online and people thought I was crazy. Well, right now we live in, in, a, in a world which is mostly off chain. And the on-chain world is minuscule, but the trend is just as clear. On-chain is growing and off-chain is shrinking. And we're both going to live in a future which is largely on-chain. And so that transition period is in front of us. And there's a huge amount of innovation that can that's going to need to happen in order to power that. So that's why we do what we do. Yeah. One thing you said that really stuck out to me uh, in this vein was you said, one thing I dislike about crypto is when people say, when can I buy, when, when can I pay for my coffee with it? Like, it's easy to buy coffee was your point, right? We don't need right. web three for that, but what do we need web three for in your, in your opinion, like um, coming off of that comment? Oh, well, so, you know, I, I agree that, um, you know, the, there's not a lot of friction in the buy a coffee uh, uh, moment. And so, you know, uh, and by the way, it's a highly optimized experience driven by a lot of great technologies to make that possible. Um, my biggest things are first off financial inclusion that, you know, uh, it's hard to have perspective as those who are relatively well serviced by modern banking systems that, that most of the world does not enjoy that luxury. Um, uh, and, you know, particularly if you live in a geography that has an unstable core currency or is, is you know, racked by inflation, which now here in the US we're obviously dealing with, that you, you basically have no escape and that, you know, Web3 provides, you know, sort of a critical lifeline for, for billions of people in the world um, that have never had access to, to any sort of financial services or that are, are really just their, their whole life prospects are governed by, you know, corrupt institutions that don't really maybe have their best interest in mind. And this is a, an opt out of that, which I think is highly constructive given the, the state of global affairs. One. Um, two, uh, uh, there have been, you know, I have the saying, like, what's the definition of being rich? The definition of being rich is when your money makes money, right? So you have assets and your assets are uh, produce income and then you live off that. So you never reduce your principal. The problem with that is to be rich, you generally need a lot of assets to start. And you need access to specialized financial services that can help you, you know, help those 
be productive, right? The world of Web3 democratizes this, right? First off, doesn't matter how much you have, your assets can, can start to produce yield at the smallest levels, right? 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks of worth of value can start producing yield, one. And two, everybody has equal access to these services. So if you're so inclined and curious, then you can you know, manipulate and, and have access to the most sophisticated services that, that anybody else does. Hey, you mix that with young people in developing countries, right? You say, start out as a teenager, you start out with some good practices here, you start building yield. And over the course of your lifespan, this can be transformative for you and your family and your community, right? And, and there's just no other technology out there that I think has that type of potential. And then finally, I just think there's just a huge amount of innovation that's happening. And there's all sorts of new stuff being generated that wouldn't have been possible without this. Like, you know, there's, we are on the cusp of a massive renaissance in the creative industries and in the art world, because, you know, Art so far has been governed by a pretty tight and pretty narrow range of distribution that's being disrupted in ways just like the internet. And that's pretty fantastic if you are on the creative side of things. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been doing a lot of reporting on El Salvador um, and what they're doing with Bitcoin. And that one of the things that really strikes me is that it incentivizes people to save money down there where, you know, inflated, inflation was so bad that, you know, they didn't want to save dollars. Like people literally buy cement cinder blocks and keep them because they know that they're going to increase in value. And so when they need money, they'll sell the cinder blocks and get some cash. But now that Bitcoin is entering the economy, people have an incentive to save it. And, and it, you know, it can obviously accrue in value, it can go down in value, but over time, Bitcoin tends to go up. And so it's, it's really having a, a really interesting effect on people's psychology about like the future and hope and all sorts of things. Yeah. So what is the ROI of optimism, right? Where you're like, I live in a world which is <clears throat> naturally pessimistic because tomorrow is going to be worse than today. And I have to, I have to think about that versus you introduce this one small innovation, which again, has not been completely flawless, but nothing ever is. And, and not only does it have this financial impact, it has this psychological impact. And now uh, tomorrow's better than today, right? Yeah. And, and that's not just great for the individual, it's great for the family and generationally. And again, it's just, it's hard to understate how transformative this capability is. And again, those of us in the US may have the sort of the, the least perspective on this, meaning because we just sort of enjoy relatively robust financial services today. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, um, I think it is hard to understate the, the impact of potential. And by the way, then, then against that backdrop, you go, I really don't care how convenient it is for you to buy your coffee. Like, like, dude, I get it, right? That's a thing that you're sort of familiar with. But, but really, like, that's, that's a first world problem uh, by three orders of magnitude, right? The last thing we should be worrying about is how to improve an already great experience for you know, those who have the privilege of buying nice coffee, right? Um, instead, let's think about more fundamental challenges and more fundamental issues. So, you know, uh, again, uh, I tend not to spend a lot of calories worried about the skeptics, um, only because uh, history will show that over time they'll all come along for the ride. Yeah. What is the ROI on optimism? That is a wonderful uh, way to leave this. Uh, Matt, uh, thank you so much for the time. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, best of luck with Block Native. I think what you guys are doing there is fascinating and, and very necessary. And uh, hopefully you can get out uh, on your hydrofoil soon. Yeah, totally. So uh, appreciate being a guest on your show, Matt. Great to be here. Anyone who's interested to know about Block Native, you can find us at blocknative.com um, or at Block Native on Twitter. I am at M Cutler, my first initial and my last name on Twitter. And I'm, uh, I'm involved in a lot of events. So uh, next week, I'll be in Amsterdam at DevConnect. Um, if you're interested in what we're doing, by all means, please introduce yourself. Uh, I have had the privilege of, of working with a lot of the, the top minds in the space and have been inspired by how sort of... Um, open and collaborative they are. And, and we at Block Native very much try to be the same way. And so we encourage everybody else in the space. And if you're new to the space, uh, don't be bashful. Uh, please do come up and say hello and ask questions, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. And I will um, put links to all that stuff in the show notes as well. And uh, I'll probably link to Ethereum is a dark forest because everyone should check that, check that out if they haven't. Um, but again, Matt, thank you again so much for the time. I really appreciate it. And again, it was fascinating. You bet, thank you.